Praise God. Well, for the next couple of weeks, not counting next week, we'll be talking about Christmas. But I'm going to be t- talking about fasting and getting prepared, preparing our hearts for fasting. As I said at the beginning of the service, I believe this is a very important part of our church and what God wants to do in our church every year. So we set aside the first three weeks of January to fast, pray, seek God, and we always experience wonderful, wonderful results. Now, uh, it's very biblical when you fast and pray to, to believe God for specific things. We see that throughout Scripture. But I'll be honest, when I fast and pray, I'm not typically fasting for answered prayer. If you have something in your life that you need answered, you can certainly fast and pray for it. It's very biblical to do that. But I'll tell you, when I fast and pray, what I'm really after is a reviving of my relationship with God. That's what I'm really after. I'm, I'm after the, the staleness and the crustiness that has tried to attach itself to my heart throughout the year. I am after trying to get that fallow ground broke up and focus my attention on God, focus my heart on God, focus my prayer life on God, so that 2015, He can use me, amen, and I can be, it can be the best year for our relationship that I've had so far. I want to begin this morning, you can turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, as you're turning there, I, <clears throat> have you guys seen... How many of you, just by a quick show of hands, have went Black Friday shopping this last this this last couple of weeks, right after Thanksgiving? Anybody? Okay, just a few. The rest, of, so I think we got some people lying in here because I know I saw a few. I heard a few of y'all posting on Facebook. Uh, <clears throat> well, every year I don't go Black Friday shopping, and I, I don't have anything against Black Friday shopping, but. The only participation that I have in Black Friday shopping is to watch the videos that come out after Black Friday shopping about all the fights that took place at Walmart and people tripping each other and and trampling each other to get a TV. That's the only part I play, just to watch the videos after. But every year, these videos surface of people that they literally get in fist fights to save, you know, ten, twenty, forty, sixty dollars over a TV, and and even worse than that, I mean, people are trampled to death you know, as the doors open. And I tell you, if you want to have any love for humanity, if you want to have any hope for the human race, do not watch these videos, okay? I'm going to tell you, it does not help you. If you are trying to love the people in this planet, don't watch these videos. It will not help you. It will hinder you. But in this, that's just a small picture. I'm sure nobody in here did anything like that. I'm sure y'all, if somebody jerked a TV out of y'all's hand, I'm sure y'all just would love on them and just smile. I'm sure everybody in here would do that. (laughs) <laughs> but in this generation, I, of course, again, I don't have anything against Black Friday, but that's just kind of a picture of, so the day before, we're celebrating everything that we're so thankful for. Oh, my Lord, just so thankful. Everybody gather around the table, and they're just supposed to be a day of thanksgiving, thanking God for all that we have. And, and then the very next day, go out and really do just the opposite. Just I'm talking about the people in these videos, you know, just fighting each other, just going after stuff. And it just, in that kind of generation that, that we live in, this whole concept of fasting is so foreign. It, this, this, this generation of get more, press for more, whatever makes me happy, do it. Don't care who it hurts, don't care who it bothers. Go after whatever makes you happy. Just do that. That's all you need to worry about. In that type of generation, this concept of fasting is so foreign. Like, why would you intentionally impose suffering on yourself? Every, my whole life is spent trying to avoid suffering. My whole life is trying to identify discomfort in my life and replace it with comfort. Why would you intentionally put yourself in a place of discomfort and in a place of suffering? Why would you do that? It's so foreign to this generation. But I'll tell you what, it's not foreign and shouldn't be foreign to the people of God. When you fast, you are intentionally putting yourself in a a place of discomfort. Now, I want to read to you in 2 Timothy 3.1 before we get into that. And I'm I'm just going to give you a few things this morning about fasting that I believe will help us as we prepare our hearts. Because, you know, you really do have to prepare your hearts for a fast. And I've, I've figured this out over the course of our time every year doing fasting. There have been times that 
really the fast is almost life changing. And, the, and then there have been other times where I come to the end of it and I'm like, you know, what did I really get out of this? And the difference is, for me, has always been how I prepared myself leading up to the fast. You know, if I just don't even really think about it in the night before we're going to fast, I kind of sit down and figure out, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this. You know, I don't really get that much out of it. But if the weeks leading up to it, I begin to prepare my heart and prepare my mind and seek God, Lord, what do you want me to do in this? What are you asking me to, to give up? and begin to prepare my heart for it and really meditate on it and pray about it, then I find that the fast, there's more fruit that comes out of it. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, you there yet? If not, they're going to put it on the screen for you. Paul is writing to Timothy, he said, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What he's describing is the spirit of the world, the spirit of this world, the spirit of this present age that we live in. And if you're not careful whether you're a believer or not, this spirit will try to attach itself to you. Even Christians can begin to see these things popping up in their lives. You're not immune to it. None of us are. Now, if you read through this and you say, in the last days it's going to be like this, and you start going through that list, it seems a little bit bleak. Doesn't it? It doesn't seem like Paul had a very positive outlook about humanity and what was going to be happening, but I believe that this was from the Holy Spirit. I believe he was seeing this by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think Paul knew when the last days were. For all he knew, they were going to be just a few months or maybe a few years away, but he didn't know that he was talking about hundreds of years away from him, and he's probably looking at his generation thinking, Man, this, my generation looks like this, but boy, if he could see the generation that we're in now and the one that's coming up. All of these things are beginning to be present. Now, the reason I'm reading this to you this morning is because there are at least six things and probably more in this passage that fasting directly counteracts in your life. Every one of these things that he listed will try to attach itself to you at one time or another. Many of us are tempted, I think probably every day, to to be lovers of self. In other words, to be selfish, to live selfish. Well, fasting counteracts that. Let me give you those six things. There's probably more than that in, in this list. But number one, he said people will be lovers of self. When you fast, what you are doing is you are telling self you don't get every little thing that you want. Every little thing that makes you happy. Every little thing that makes you comfortable. I don't jump when you say jump. I don't do when you say do. I lead you. Okay, now I know for some of you this is funny. It sounds like you got schizophrenia or something. You know, like double personality. What are you talking about? Well, the Bible tells us that there are two natures that are at war within us. Galatians chapter 6 tells us that. That the spirit and the flesh, the Bible says, are always warring against one another. And so when you fast, what you're doing is you're telling self, I don't live for you. I don't live to please you. Every decision I make is not to make you happy. I live to please God. I am not a lover of self. I'm a lover of God. So fasting directly counteracts that spirit of selfishness that would try to come on you. The next two and they kind of go together he says that people will be proud and that they will be arrogant they will be proud and they will be arrogant and uh we see this we see a lot of of uh, pride and arrogance in this generation people that are very confident in themselves i think one of the biggest uh, displays of pride and arrogance in our generation is this constant attitude and movement towards uh the idea that we don't need god We want God out of government. We want God out of education. We want God out of marriage. We want God out of everything. And that really is stemming out of pride. 
and arrogance. Well, fasting counteracts pride and arrogance because, because fasting is very humbling. It's a humbling experience. When you begin to fast and, and every day you can rely on yourself and all of a sudden now you're, you're hungry and you're having pain and, and you're a little bit dizzy and you're lightheaded because you're depriving yourself of food. It's a very humbling experience and it's meant to humble you. It's meant to humble yourself before God because what it does, it puts you in a place of submission and reliance on God. The other thing he says is that they will be ungrateful. So another thing we can look for in these last days is for people to be ungrateful. Things that they should be thankful for, they're not thankful for. Things that they should be rejoicing about, they're, they're, not, they're not thankful for them. Things that they should be happy about, they're not. They're just ungrateful for anything. And I've, I've seen this. I told the story. Uh, I, think to, I don't think I've told this from the pulpit. I think I was talking to some leaders. One of our life groups did an outreach not too long ago, and they were at a local food pantry, and they were serving lunch. And one of the ladies walked through, and they were serving beans. And so they, they put some beans in a bowl, and they passed it to her, and she looked at it, and she said, Beans? Well, I can get beans at home. <laughs> and I'm not sure if somebody said, well, why are you here? <laughs> if you could get it at home, what are you doing here? But something you ought to be grateful for, something you ought to be thankful for, not. Now, of course, we can look at a situation like that and point fingers, but what about us? What about things in our life that we ought to be thankful for that we're not? Things we ought to be thanking God about, but all, all we do is complain. Well... Fasting, believe it or not, will counteract that spirit of ungratefulness. Because all the things that you were ungrateful for, when you begin to remove the simplest things like food, television, technology, when you begin to remove those things from your life and you spend 21 days without it, all of a sudden you find yourself being just a little bit more thankful. It will counteract that spirit of ungratefulness. Now, this is, this is one of the main reasons that my wife and I always have our children fast along with us which I think is a brilliant idea. It's good for the whole family, trust me. And already our kids, we mentioned it, uh, it driving in the car the other night, and they said, oh, fasting, oh no, we got a fast coming up. Now, you know, we don't make them do what we do. It's appropriate for them. Our children are six and four, but they know every year we're going to fast some things. We're going to fast the, the iPad and some technology and, and candy and different things like that. They're going to make a, a sacrifice for God. And, and when they're done, boy, they're so grateful for all those things that they had to not have during those 21 days. The other thing he says is that they will be unappeasable. This is very similar to being ungrateful, but in other words, unappeasable. No ma it's never enough. No matter what is done, it, you, just, it cannot, you, cannot be, you cannot make them happy. No matter what's done, it's just never enough. And this is an entitlement attitude. It's an attitude of entitlement where we start to think that we deserve certain things. We start to think that we ought to have certain that things ought to be a certain way. Uh, you know, this happens in people's jobs. Instead of just being thankful they have a job, you know, they start looking at all the things that, that, that they're not getting. You know, it happens in, in churches. You know, you only see the negative instead of seeing all the positive things they're doing. It's almost unappeasable. Can't make them happy. Well, fasting counteracts that. Makes you happy and thankful for the little things. Also, he says, in the last days they will be without self-control. Now, self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And he says, in the last days, people will, will be without it. They will not be able to control themselves. They will not be able to control their lust. They will not be able to control their anger. They will not be able to control themselves. They will be without self-control. They, they've not learned to discipline themselves. Now, if you think about that word self-control, what it literally means is to lead self, to, to lead yourself, to be a leader of yourself. And fasting puts you in that position of leadership over yourself where you're telling yourself what we're going to do every day. In other words, I'm not, you know, every day a lot of people eat, you know, when they're hungry. That's just kind of the common sense thing. My wife always makes fun of me because I have windows where I eat in. If, if I'm hungry and it's not in that, in that one hour to an hour and a half window, I don't eat. It just, well, you're hungry. Eat. No, it's not in the window. You know, I have to eat in that window. I don't know why, just that way. But 
a lot of people, most normal people, probably eat when they're hungry. And what that is, is your body is giving you cues, I'm hungry, feed me. And when you take control as the leader of self and the leader of body, you say, I don't care that you're hungry. I'm not feeding you what you want right now. I'm not giving it to you. Now, now that sounds like that's you know, not very pleasant, but that's what fasting is all about. It puts you in that place of getting back control over your life and over yourself. Finally, he says, in the last days, people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So what are you submitted to? That's, that's what tells you what is God in your life, what you are submitted to. Do you obey God or do you obey your appetite? Do you obey God or do you, do you follow pleasure? Do you do whatever brings you pleasure in your life? Some people don't go to church on Sunday morning because on Sunday morning, pleasure is speaking loud and clear, saying stay in bed, stay home, watch TV, you know, don't, don't go to church. Even though your spirit wants to be here, needs to be here to feed on the Word of God. But some, a lot of people, they love pleasure so much, and really this would apply, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And what fasting does is it helps you get back in that place of saying, no, I don't live for pleasure. I don't live for comfort. I live for God, and I'm a lover of God. And fasting helps bring that back into your life. Amen. See, the spirit of the world that he's describing here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's a very aggressive spirit, and it has to be resisted. If you're passive about it, if you never have a plan of attack to resist the spirit of the world that's trying to come on you and come on your family, it will gobble you up. But the spirit of the world has to be resisted. Just by default, just by living in this life, going you know, day in, day out, the spirit of the world is attaching itself to you. And there has to be times where you pull away from that and you kind of brush that thing off and you get cleaned up and you refocus and you make sure that things are aligned properly in your life. And fasting does that. Now, I want to give you... Just a few points about fasting. We're going to kind of go through these fast this morning. They're not uh, necessarily all connected to one another, but they, they all have to do with fasting. First of all, and, and, and if you want to write these down, you can. It probably would help you during the 21 days to, to have these and reference them during the 21 days. Maybe even the scriptures we're going to read this morning might be good to look at them during the 21 days that we're fasting. First thing is this. Fasting is self-imposed suffering. Fasting is self-imposed suffering. Or a lighter way of saying it would be it is self-imposed discomfort. Now, throughout Scripture, we see two principles concerning suffering. The first one is that suffering produces character. Suffering produces character. Now, suffering is going to happen in this life. I mean, everybody knows that. Suffering is going to happen. But rather than passively waiting for suffering just to happen when it happens, fasting is being proactive about making sure that suffering happens in a designated amount of time. And I know that seems counterintuitive. Why would you do that? The reason is because suffering produces character. And if you live in a society where discomfort uh, has been almost eliminated from daily life, it's a good practice to reinstate a little bit of suffering from time to time back in your life. I've, I've, I've referenced many times, um, you know, the fact that when I was younger, I would lead backpacking trips, kids into the wilderness. And you have kids that whenever they want water, they just turn the faucet on. Whenever they need to use the bathroom, they just go to the bathroom. And it's all easy. Whenever they want something to drink, they just open the refrigerator. Whenever they want to go to bed, they just climb onto the mattress Whenever they want to come out of the rain, they just walk inside. And all of a sudden, you put them in the wilderness, and they're, they're, all of that's stripped away. And it's intentional suffering, intentional discomfort that's placed. Why? Because it builds character. And this is a scriptural principle. Anybody who has suffered or, or gone through suffering knows this, that it builds character. 
But everything in, our, in us, especially our flesh, fights it, and we don't want to suffer, and so we resist it. But you have to understand, we live in a society that most inventions, cell phone, microwave, you know, you just go on down the list, most things are invented for one purpose, and it is to eliminate discomfort and to eliminate inconvenience. Most of the, the inventions that we have today now are just to eliminate some sort of inconvenience or some sort of discomfort from our life. And if you systematically eliminate every discomfort, you know, uh, every inconvenience from your life, you're left with a world where you're not really tested very often. And this is why it's important to intentionally self-impose discomfort upon your life from time to time. We don't do it the whole year, but for 21 days we do that. Fasting is self-imposed suffering. Romans chapter 5 verse 3 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Why would Paul rejoice in his suffering? He tells us in the next sentence. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So it's a biblical principle that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And this is one problem with our children today, is that they are not allowed to suffer. And, and this is important as a parent to understand that if you rescue your child from every, every amount of suffering that they face, you are stealing from them opportunities for character to be built. And most any time I talk to somebody that runs a business, most any time, that I talk to somebody who runs a business or they are a supervisor, the common thing that I hear is you cannot find good help. You cannot find good help. Can't find people that will stay. Can't find people that will show up on time. Can't find people that will work hard. What they're saying is you can't find people with character. And that's because if you raise an entire generation where they, where they are shielded and sheltered from comfort or shielded and, shel and sheltered from suffering and all that they have is comfort, then there's no character that's produced. And I heard somebody say this the other day. They said, why is it that the older generation, uh, that they complain about the younger generation saying, you know, they, they don't work, they don't do their this way, they're that. They, they complain about the younger generation as if they had nothing to do with it. It's important to understand that the, the younger generation was produced. And that's why it's important for parents to understand that now we are raising up the next generation and we don't want to find ourselves in that position complaining about the younger generation. Well, why are they that way? Well, just remember, we raised them. And if we don't understand this concept that in a, in a proper spirit-led way there needs to be a little bit of discomfort and a little bit of suffering in a child's life, they're not going to, they don't need to be shielded from every, everything that causes them pain and discomfort. I'm glad y'all are getting something this morning. I heard y'all over here amen and me. Number two, thing about suffering. Suffering produces character, but suffering, especially for a Christian, leads to reliance on God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He said what we went through for Christ, what we went through for the gospel was so intense and it was so difficult that he said we thought we were going to die. And we actually started to despair for life itself. But he said we realized that it was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. When we go through affliction and we go through suffering, it will produce reliance on God if you have the proper attitude. So when you're fasting, you experience some discomfort, and you will, whether it be for food or some other thing that you've withheld. When you experience discomfort, you can, you can get frustrated, you can get mad, you can quit, or you can turn to God. And you can rely on God in that, in that moment. Number two thing I want to tell you about fasting this morning is that fasting is for the ordinary person. Fasting is for the ordinary person. Fasting is not for the super spiritual, or I should say not only, 
for the super spiritual, or at least those who think they are super spiritual. Okay, fasting is for the ordinary person. This, don't, don't look at this and go, well, you know, only those super spiritual people fast. I'm just an ordinary person, you know, that just kind of comes to church every now and then, and I don't really know if fasting is for me. I want you to know that fasting is for you. Fasting is for you. Fasting is for the ordinary person. You don't have to be super spiritual. As a matter of fact, if your relationship with God is not really where you want it to be, trust me, fasting is for you. Fasting will help lead you into that. As a matter of fact, I preached a sermon back back, uh, at the beginning of the year. We did a sermon series called Thrive, and we were talking about having a vibrant prayer life. And one one of the sermons that I preached is that God likes ordinary people. And if you haven't listened to that, I encourage you to listen to it. It's called God Likes Ordinary People. And what we, in that sermon, we talked about the people that God picked for, for his disciples. Fishermen, tax collectors. These were men, you know, that worked with their hands, that really, they were sinners. They, were, they weren't, you know, even though they were Jewish people, they, they didn't have any credentials, hadn't been to school, had no education. And there were people like that. They were called the Pharisees. And the Sadducees and the scribes, these were people that knew the Bible inside and out, backwards and forwards. They knew the Word of God, you know, incredibly well. But when Jesus got ready to pick his disciples, he did not go to the synagogue. He did not go to the temple to pick his disciples. He went to the loading docks and the the fishermen wharfs and he picked the fishermen And he went down to check into cash and found the clerk store, which would be the tax collector. And, and called them to be his disciple. Now, I know you think that, well, that, that's the, but look, I'm just telling you, if Jesus had come in our generation, he would not have walked in one life church to choose his disciples. Apparently, according to that. That's not, the, in other words, he wouldn't have just picked people because they were religious or spiritual on the outside. Even when he spent his time, Jesus did not enjoy spending his time with Pharisees, the super religious people. He didn't enjoy spending his time. He spent his time among the broken, the needy, uh, the normal, just ordinary people. So I'm saying that because you have to understand that sometimes you can sit in a service like this and you can go, well, I'm sure you know the pastor, he knows about fasting and he'll fast and maybe that worship leader up there, you know, she'll fast and maybe some real spiritual people. Listen, I I think every single person in this room, every person that calls One Life Church their home, I believe you ought to fast to one degree or another. Now, you're to be spirit-led on that. We We don't have something you have to do this, but I think everybody ought to do something. I think everybody ought to do something. And again, it's not for the super spiritual because Jesus actually criticized the super spiritual the way that they prayed and the way that they fasted. Jesus looked and turned to the ordinary people and he said, look, you see how those Pharisees fast? He said, don't fast like them. They don't know what they're doing, okay? You see how they're praying? You see how those real spiritual people over there are praying? He said, don't pray like them. They are not, that is not pleasing to God. And he even gave an example of a spiritual person and an ordinary person praying. He said the real spiritual person went before God and they said this big, long, eloquent prayer. Thank God I'm not like sinners. Thank God I'm, you know, have my life in order. And he said there's a sinner over here beating his chest before God saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Just humbly calling out. He said that's the prayer that God receives is from the heart of a home person. I'm just saying that because you need to understand that God loves ordinary people. And so when you fast as just an ordinary person, you go, I've never fasted before. I don't know what I'm doing. Great. I believe it's pleasing to God. I believe it's pleasing to God when people that don't really have it all figured out say, you know what, I'm going to do this for you, God. I'm going to do, and you can walk me through it. You can help. And besides that, every person in this room, even those that have fasted, there was that time that they did it for the first time. And so this should be and could be your first time if you've never done it before. And you will get something out of it. It's a promise from God. I probably say this scripture every week. I hope you don't get tired of hearing it. It's James 4.4. 4. He said, draw unto me and I will draw unto you. So when we draw close to God, when we draw to him, he draws to us. And that's what fasting is. We set ourselves aside to draw close to God for this season. And, and he responds. Number three, fasting does not... Turn God into a genie. 
A lot of people think, well, I've been praying about this and nothing's happened, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast and pray about it. And I'm going to sort of make it happen, you know, by fasting and praying. Just understand that fasting does not turn God into a genie. All the same principles of prayer still apply. All the same principles of faith still apply. All the same principles of obedience still apply. God, fasting does not turn God into a genie. So if you fast and you pray about something and you don't get it, you should, your response shouldn't be, well, you know, that fasting stuff, it doesn't work because I fasted and prayed about that and God didn't give me what, we, what I wanted. Well, if that's your attitude of fasting and praying, then you're probably not going to get a lot out of it. And as I said before, absolutely nothing, with wrong, nothing wrong with fasting and praying about something, but I really don't fast and pray for answered prayer. Um, uh, occasionally, sometimes throughout the years, we've had something that we're fasting and praying about, you know, like for God to move. But really, my whole focus is I just want to draw close to God in that time. And I let him take care of all those, all those other needs. Just like he said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. You know, David did that. If you'll remember, David fasted when he sinned with Bathsheba. And the child came down with a sickness as a judgment from God and, the, and was going to die. And David fasted and prayed for that baby. He fasted and prayed, fasted and prayed, fasted and prayed. And then uh, the baby died. And when he got up, you know, he didn't shake his fist at God and say, God, I fasted and prayed. Why didn't you do this for me? Matter of fact, his servant said, I don't understand this. You know, when you were fasting and praying, you were, you were covering yourself in, in sackcloth and ashes. You're not eating anything. You're mourning. And now that the child is dead, you're up. You've bathed yourself. You're eating. It doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, because when I was fasting, there was hope that it could still happen. But then once the baby's dead, why should I continue mourning and fasting? The will of God, you know, has been done. So that ought to be our attitude, is I'm fasting and praying for the will of God to be done, not my will. Yeah. Finally, ver uh, well, no, not finally, but number four, it says uh, fasting is voluntary. Fasting is voluntary. In other words, you don't have to fast. There's, there's nothing in, it has nothing to do with salvation. You know, you don't. <laughs> So, so fasting is completely voluntary. It's your choice to do it or not to do it. And it's really the only way you should do it is if, is if you want to do it. If you want to do it from the right heart. You don't need to do it to impress anybody. You don't need to do it under obligation from me or the church or anything. It's if you want to do it. If you want to draw closer to God. It's a, it's a, it's a choice that you have. Um, but I do believe that it is a scriptural command for us to fast so all believers should fast at some point okay if you for whatever reason you can't do it now or you don't want to do it now you know there are there are every believer should fast at some point but we are free to be led by the spirit on how and when you fast there's no set thing in scripture about what a, what a fast has to look like, the length of time. You know, some people fasted for three days. Some people fasted for 21 days. Some people fasted for 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. The, uh, the disciples, the apostles in the book of Acts fasted in, in prayer for, you know, a couple days at a time. And then even what they fasted. Some people did complete fast, no food whatsoever, only water. Some people, like Daniel, did the Daniel fast where he didn't have any, uh, the Bible says, pleasant uh, pleasant food. No, for, for Daniel, it was no dessert, no sweets, no pleasant uh, food, no wine, no meat. He cut that out for 21 days. So a fast is really something that you need to be spirit-led on. And, and how we always look at it is, is there anything in our life that is, is we're becoming too dependent on? You know, is there anything in our life that, that we need to cut out? And sometimes we go real intense, you know. And for 21 days, uh, occasionally, what we've done in the past is we'll have like three days out of the week where we're just eating maybe fish and vegetables. And then the other, you know, uh, two or three days, maybe we just do like uh, nuts and juice and stuff like that. So you can, you can break it up. You can do it however you want to do. And probably the final week before the fast, we'll go into more specifics about some options that you can do. But it's, it's important now to start praying and thinking about what you want to do, what you would want to give up. And uh, I encourage you not to be overzealous. You know, if you've never fasted before, don't just think, hey, I'm going to go 21 days with no food. 
Um, you might regret that. About six hours in, you might regret that. But, uh, you know, you want to be real thoughtful and prayerful about it, but I believe the Lord will lead you. Okay, but it's important to know fasting is voluntary. This is not to burden you. This is to be a blessing in the life of, of a believer. Okay, number five, fasting is not giving up sin. Okay, fasting is not giving up sin. You don't, in other words, if you have sin in your life, you don't give up sin for 21 days and then go back to it. Okay, I've heard this, I've seen this, you know, well, I'm going to give up looking at porn for 21 days. Well, fasting is really not about giving up sin. Okay, repentance is about giving up sin. All right, fasting, in other words, if you have sin in your life, you don't need a plan to abstain from it for 21 days and then go back to sinning. Okay, uh, sin should be given up now and immediately, and your intention when you give it up is that it should be forever because that's what repentance is, and that's what, when you repent of sin, it literally means to turn from it and to go a different direction. So, you, you know, I've seen that, well, I'm doing this, I'm going to give it up for 21 days. No, you need to repent of sin, turn from sin, get sin out of your life. Fasting is not for giving up sin. Actually, uh, fasting is for giving up things that are normally good in your life, but you're just giving them up voluntarily. For example, nothing wrong with, you know, eating, eating a little dessert every now and then, nothing wrong with eating food, of course, but you're giving up things that are good just because you can and just for God. And we've already talked about some of the reasons why. You're giving up uh, privileges, freedoms that you have as a believer. Things that in Christ you are free to, to do or not do. Freedoms that you have in Christ to participate in or not participate in. You're giving those freedoms up voluntarily. Not because they're sin, not because they're evil. You're giving them up uh, for God so that he can work in your life. Another important thing, I believe, to give up while you're fasting is distractions. For my, for my family, we will typically fast, you know, uh, uh, television. We will fast, you know, technology, uh, our, our iPads and phone. We'll have like a, you know, we have to use them to work and we use them to read and stuff like that. But, but um, anything extracurricular, maybe for a certain time of the day, like when I get off work, you know, maybe from the time I get off to the time the, the kids go to bed, no, no technology and we just spend family time together. It's important to do those types of things um, so that nothing becomes an addiction to you and so that you don't have any distractions in your life during this time. Hebrews 12, 1 talks about this idea of laying aside things that are not necessarily sin. Jesus said in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So he said, you're running a race, so you need to lay aside every weight and sin. I believe a weight is something that's not necessarily sin, but it's something that's weighing you down. It could be a distraction, something that's slowing you down. It's important to Examine your life from time, to dent, from time to time and make sure there are no weights that are slowing you down from, from what you're doing or hindering your relationship with God. Now, last thing I want to tell you this morning is that when you are preparing to fast and you are deciding what to fast, there will be two voices that are, that are speaking in your life, the flesh and the spirit. As you're deciding, what should I fast? How, how, how much do we want to do? How little do we want to do? Just understand that the flesh and the spirit will be talking because your flesh will be going, oh, no, you don't need to give that up. Oh, no, that's too... Look, you don't want to get overzealous. You heard what he said about not getting overzealous. You don't, you don't want to you know, be too intense with this. And then your spirit will be saying, oh, no, you need that. You need to let go of that. You need to lay that down. So there will be two voices speaking, and you need to decipher... What's coming from God and what's just coming from that old lazy flesh that we all have? Romans chapter 8 verse 5, listen to this. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So the flesh is hostile to God. The flesh just wants to do what it wants to do. It doesn't want to submit to God. It doesn't want to submit to God's Word. Is hostile towards God. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So this is very important. It's very important we learn to put the flesh under and to live by the Spirit. Paul, if you read this whole chapter, he talks extensively about this in Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 6. He talks extensively about how to live by the Spirit and to put off the old man. To put off the old man, that old man that wants to sin, that old flesh that wants to do things its way, to put it off and to live by the Spirit of God. Now knowing this, knowing that there's going to be that battle between the flesh and the Spirit, let me give you just a a few uh, little tips that will help you through your fast. First of all, whatever you decide to fast, you must write it down. You need evidence of what you committed to. Because halfway in, your flesh will start talking to you. And he will say, now, now what did you really mean when you said you were going to fast this? Did you really mean that you was going to do that every day? Or did you just think it was going to be a few? You know, what, what was your heart when you said you were going to do that? Well, you need to write it down so you can go back and look. And, and there's proof and evidence of what you said you were going to fast. Because I'm telling you, your flesh is he's, he's tricky. She's tricky. They will, uh, your flesh will trick you and play tricks on your mind and you will, it will be hard to stick to it if you don't write it down. Number two, do not let the physical symptoms trick you into thinking that something's wrong. Okay, this is another big one. Listen, fasting is supposed to hurt. Okay, you will get lightheaded. You will get dizzy. You might get nauseate, nauseated. You might feel weak. You might, you might need to sleep more. You might be grumpy. You might be irritable. You might have bad breath. Okay? All these things are symptoms and results of fasting, especially the first few days. Now, please, by all means, if you have some sort of physical problem that you're aware of, Check with your doctor. You know, don't, don't override that. But I'm talking about for the average healthy person, don't start, you know, experiencing physical symptoms to go, oh, something's wrong. I got a bail on the fast. No, something's right. Okay? It's working. That's what it means. And it, and it will, you are going to feel, and actually quite the contrary, there's tons of research, and I encourage you to go look. There are tons of research about the benefits and healing benefits of fasting. It's actually very, very good and healthy physically for your body to go through a period of fasting. The body was designed to go through periods of fasting. God designed it that way. And uh, there are even people that, that have, you know, illnesses that medicine can't cure that have, through fasting, been able to find healing. So I encourage you to go research that and look. But it's, it's actually, um, when you begin to feel those symptoms happening, your body is, is cleansing itself of of toxins and things that have gotten built up, but it'll only last for a few days. And, and this weakness that you're experiencing is one of the greatest benefits of fasting. And, and I want to read this. this is the last scripture we're going to read this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Listen to what Paul says about weakness. Paul, as you, as you know, had, had the greatest revelation of all the New Testament writers about the cross and he's writing here, Second Corinthians twelve seven. He says, "So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh." Now, a thorn in the flesh just means something, something that he's a nagging issue that he had to deal with on a regular basis. <clears throat> he's not clear about what the thorn in the flesh was. People speculate about what it was. No one knows what it was. He doesn't tell us. A thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he, he, he was not enjoying this. Three times 
he went to God. Even though he had an answer the first and second time, the third time he went back again and said, Lord, please take this from me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Listen to that. Think about that when you're fasting. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, but I feel horrible today. I have a headache. I'm weak. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul said, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is a if you've never experienced this and you've never done this, you may find that hard to understand. But it's, you'll, you'll really discover this in fasting. This is such a true statement that Paul says that when I am weak, then I am made strong. Because in that weakness, what happens is, is that you turn to God. When you would normally turn to food, when you would normally turn to something else, you turn to God. And when you turn to God... He strengthens you. He is so faithful to put His grace on you. And I'm telling you, you will, you will experience a reviving in your spiritual life, in your Bible reading, in your prayer time. You will experience a powerful, a powerful uh, just infusion of strength and energy during that time. So I encourage you, as we leave today, and, and over the next couple of weeks, and, and you go through Christmas, hey, you know, have fun, enjoy Christmas. You know, don't, don't start your fasting early. Enjoy Christmas. But then just be thinking about what you want to fast. What is God leading you to fast? And the more thought and time and prayer you put into it, I believe the more prepared you're going to be to fast come January 2nd. Amen.